may be receptive to receive your word and that you will be glorified in Jesus name Amen, Amen. I think it's first it's important that we can consider what we consist of. Now, 1 Thessalonians 5.23 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. There are three parts <coughs> of a body. Spirit, soul and body. Now, A lot of people say we are a spirit, we have a soul, and we uh, uh, walk around in a body. But that's not strictly true. The thing I've done if we look at spirit as the middle. soul and body. Now, the body is the soma. Soma. That's the Greek for the body. The spirit is psych. If you think your body is ill, you have a psychosomatic illness. Dang. The spirit, soul, a body. This body is soma. The spirit is psych. Therefore, if you have a you think you're ill, you have a psychosomatic disease. Now, the soul is the mind, will, and emotions. Obviously, the body is affected by the five senses. Okay? The body is affected by the five senses. The spirit is dead in an un un unregenerate person, the spirit is dead, so the soul reacts to the body. Okay? Now, the spirit, when we're born again, comes alive, Word of God, and the Spirit comes alive, the five senses are still there, so you have a war between the Spirit and the body which takes place in the soul.
your body or, or your flesh, in the King James, the flesh is the bodily desires, which is called the socks. Not socks, socks. <laughs> okay? And therefore, this is what we've got to overcome. The sarks. You can see the spirit is fed by the word of God. The body is fed by the five senses. And whatever dog you feed the most wins the day. Okay. On. We should have done that before we did the last one, which is um, reconciliation. We need to go on with propitiation. It's very difficult to explain propitiation. <coughs> it's the second block, God's wrath. <coughs> because we were unable to turn away God's wrath, which is just, against our sin, Christ provided propitiation. This probably, probably signifies the removal of wrath by the offering of a gift. In the Old Testament, the word is which means atonement. Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, which is uh, the 10th of... Um, Tresavim. Sorry? Tresavim. Yeah, well, well done. <laughs> In the New Testament, the Greek word Elaskomai. 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 Which is translated, well, is, is used. This means that several English words are required to gain some real understanding of propitiation. Now we have four, four words. Covering, satisfaction, atonement, and pardon. The Word of God in the Old Testament says in Psalm 7, verse 11, God is angry with the wicked every day. The Jews of that day saw that sin inevitably rouses the strongest reaction from God who is opposed to evil in every shape or form. Though they also understood that God is slow to anger. In Nehemiah 9.17 But thou art a God ready to pardon Gracious and merciful, slow to anger, 
and of great kindness, and forsookest them not. Yet they saw that his anger was certain in the face of sin. The Jewish fathers did not see God's slowness to anger as moral flabbiness on the part of God. Something to be wondered at. To them, it was awe-inspiring and totally unexpected. Just as much as they were sure of God's wrath, they were equally sure that the uh, offering of the appropriate sacrifice might put this wrath away. Leviticus 7, 17, 11, Leviticus 17, 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. The averting of God's wrath is not something that man can bring about. to God himself who turns away his wrath and is eager to forgive Psalm 78 38 Psalm 78 verse 38 but he being full of compassion forgave their iniquity and destroyed them not Yea, many a time turned he his anger away and did not stir up his wrath. We see the force of the New Testament idea of propitiation in the following passage, Romans 3, 24 and 25. Romans 3, 24 and 25. Paul writes, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God, God had set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Paul's argument up to this point is that both Jew and Gentile are under God's condemnation. Romans 1.18 For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. The sentence of judgment has been passed against the Gentiles and the Jews. God's wrath, which he emphasizes in the opening chapter chapters of Romans, hangs over them both. Christ's saving work must include the deliverance from this wrath. This deliverance is described the, by the word propitiation. As the scripture has said in 1 John 2.2 2, and he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only but also 
for the sins of the whole world. Now I want you to note, and I've stressed it here, John is saying that while the offering of the blood of Christ was sufficient propitiation for the sins of the whole world, the complete benefits of his sacrifice are only available to those who, by faith, accept this provision for sin. To recap, Number one, man deliberately violated God's will. Number two, God is angry with man because of his sin. Number three, God demanded justice which man could not give. Number four, God provided his son, sinless son, as an atonement to bear his righteous wrath. Number five, God satisfied his just demands and covered our sin. Therefore, number six, God in his grace can and does pour his love upon those who will receive this gift by faith. This is an act of God motivated by him, his immense love whereby he accepts the blood of Christ as a complete and satisfying sacrifice for all human sin, thus establishing a means of reconciliation between God and man. The first occurrence of the Greek word for propitiation in the New Testament is an expression used by Peter in the following reference be it far from thee sometimes translated as God have mercy on you and it occurs in Matthew 1622 Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. It is only because mercy was not extended to Christ in his suffering that propitiation was made for Peter and the world. Those who have, uh, of us who have benefited from this expression of God's love also ought to love one another. As John, the Apostle uh, says, 1 John 4, 10 and 11, herein is love not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Now, It's not neat when you come the to next it one we need to de deal with is redemption.
it's the next block. And it says, slave to sin. Everyone who is not born again sins as a matter of course. As you've seen from your diagram that I did in the beginning, we sin because this is a, the natural tendency of our fleshly nature, the sarks. John 8.34, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. The picture here is of a slave who is held in the slave market until one should come who will pay the price for him. What is the price? God demands we read in Ezekiel 18.20 first bit the soul that sinneth it shall die. <coughs> Thus the price of freedom is a life. The life of one who had never sinned. Jesus is the only man who never sinned. <clears throat> Thus, he does not have to give his life for his sin. In other words, he's the only man with a life. God's word says, Hebrews 9.22 And most all things are by the law purged with blood and without the shedding of blood is no remission. Now we have to understand that Jesus willingly paid the ransom price of his own blood to buy men out of the slave market and free them to become the sons of God. In other words, Jesus Christ paid for our redemption. Now, I sense a question. How could he die? Because the Old Testament says a life for a life, a tooth for a tooth, and so on and so forth. Jesus paid for everyone. How could he? He was the creator. He was the creator. This is the most important thing. I could say to an artist, I'll destroy you. And he could say to me, destroy all my works. And I, I will destroy all my work, all, all his works. And therefore, you understand, he, he gives his life for his work. I've got that right, I think. Jesus willingly played the price, the ransom price, of his own blood to buy men out of the slave market and free them to become the sons of God. We've said that. In other words, Jesus Christ paid for our redemption, which means to buy... 
and second remove from sale and third pay a ransom the blood of Christ was our the price of our redemption 1 Peter 1 18 and 19 for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot There are three Greek words used in the New Testament to explain this. Agorazo. To purchase in the market, that means. Agorazo. As I say, to purchase in the market. The word does not mean to redeem, but figuratively, Christ is spoken of as having bought the redeemed, making them his property. The price he paid was his blood. 1 Corinthians 6.20 For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's. And 2 Peter 2 verse 1 But there were false prophets also among the people even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable her heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Now, the next word is exactly the same. Ex agorasa which means purchase and take out. It emphasises that Christians have been purchased out of the marketplace and are no longer for sale. Paul wrote about this. Paul wrote about this in Galatians 3.13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on, on a tree. And Galatians 4, 5, To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Ex agorazo, while being translated redeem, does not signify the actual redemption, but the price paid with a view to redemption. That's what Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words says. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the third word is true release on the re receipt of a ransom release on the receipt of a ransom emphasizes the liberty that belongs to a soul redeemed by God the Christian is encouraged to stand fast in the liberty Titus 2 4 
2.14, sorry, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. This redemption that Titus speaks about is the redemption from the bondage to self-will which rejects the will of God. Mm. 1 Peter 1.18 For as much as ye know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. We've read that before. Okay. Peter talks of being redeemed from a vain or useless manner of life. That is bondage to useless tradition. The true signifies the actual deliverance, the setting at liberty, which is vine's expository dictionary of New Testament words. Mm. Any questions? I made a mistake in there. We understand that the painter says spare my creation. Spare all of That's reasonable. Jesus says, take all, take me instead of all my creation. Oh, Thank That's you, it. Lord. Okay. You have achieved on the cross. So much for us. We belong to you. Help us to walk in the way that is pleasing in your sight. Yes, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.